Welcome to Praise Assembly Church Ministries, a community church focused on family, individual growth, and most importantly, the Word of God. We are here to share the love of Jesus Christ, encourage kingdom living, and equip you with the tools you will need to live the abundant life God has promised. Today you will hear an uplifting word from God shared by our pastor, Dr. Johnny L. York. It is our prayer that you will receive a personal message from the Lord today. Thank you for tuning in. Now, let's join our service. Let me go back and review our intent, purpose, and goal because we may have new viewers today and new individuals that are here today in the service so that we all would be on the same page and on one accord. The intent of this series is to provide answers to the question, why am I here? What's the reason for us being here? And the purpose is to discover why you matter to God. Every person in here, every person on earth, whether you're saved or not, you matter to God. You matter to the Lord. And the goal is to be led by the Spirit of God as children of God so that God will be glorified in the earth realm. So let's get into our lesson today to live in Eden. The Bible is such an amazing book that has been given to us by the amazing God. In it, God gives us printed instructions on how he wants us to live here in this place called earth. The Bible states God's initial intentions and God's instructions on his expectations of man And we'll see this particularly as it's written in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is more than the book of beginnings. And we all know this. It's more than the book of beginnings. The book of Genesis is the foundation for everything else that's in the word of God. It is the foundation. So so let's go back to our foundation verses and see what God is saying. God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. That's the foundation for man throughout the entire Bible. Our entire existence on earth is what God says here. We are made in the image of God after his likeness. And God says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. And over the cattle and over all the earth and and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God made man in his own image. The Bible goes and says, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And that, 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 that verse right there alone is a whole nother series. So I'm not going to take time to, 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 to dig into that and pull some things out because that's a whole different series in itself there. But we are here at verse number 28, it says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And the Bible says, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So God specifically has given man instructions and it gives man his, his intentions as to how he wants man to live in the earth realm. Now, that's given in Genesis, but it, it, it registers throughout the entire Bible and throughout our entire lives. But let's move into something here that's going to show us more relative to this lesson title. Everybody, whether you are saved or not, at some point in our lives, everyone has heard the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And everybody who's heard about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden immediately think about an apple. God never said what the fruit was. I don't know where we got this thing from it being an apple. If you don't like apples, it may be an orange for you. I don't know, or a pear. But we always automatically default to it being an apple. Adam and Eve were of the highest level of intelligence ever seen in anything God ever created. They were of the highest level of intelligence. They were functioning with full knowledge and the full wisdom of God. 
They were created complete. The, the, the first step they took was at the highest level of intelligence. They didn't have to grow. They didn't have to experience things in life that we experience. When God created them, that was it. They were at the top, the pinnacle of intelligence and wisdom and knowledge of God. Now, here is where it gets really interesting because God actually took a part of himself and he housed it in flesh and called this thing that was a part of him housed in flesh. He called it man. So Adam and Eve were functioning with all that God was and all that God had. Now, here is something that's very interesting, too. Out of this man, male part of Adam, out of man, both male and female, out of man, out of man, get, I want you to grab this, billions of men have been born out of this one man, Adam. Billions of people have been born out of this one man, Adam. And because of the sin of this one man, Adam, billions of people who are born and yet unborn are affected in their lives because of this one man. Out of him were billions of people born in sin. But God did not go back to the dust and start all over again and recreated man. Instead of God going back to the dust and recreating man, God sent Jesus. And through this one man, Jesus, all these billions of men who have been born and yet to be born now can have a new life to be reborn in the spirit of God. The Bible teaches us that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Now, God, after he took a part of himself and created this person called man, housed in flesh, God then creates a place to put this man. And the place God created to put this man is called the Garden of Eden. Now, in, in, in Genesis chapter number 2, we'll look at verses 15 through 17 because here is where it really begins to get interesting. And God took the man and put him, the man, in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you not to do anything. You have a free will. You have my full knowledge. You have my full wisdom. You're at the highest level of intelligence. And I'm putting you in the garden. And you can freely eat of everything in the garden if you choose to do so. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, now, now when he says surely die, that means you will die immediately. Let's go back and look at what God is saying here now. God says, verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden. A place called Eden. Let's talk about this now. I want us to, as we, as we go from this point on, I want us to put our religious hats to the side. I want us to put our little stories we learned growing up in church to the side. I want us to put our little theological viewpoints to the side. And let's really begin to look at what God is saying in his word here. 
And the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Eden was the place on earth for God's manifested presence to dwell. Now let's let's look at this for a second. God's spirit is all over the earth. But he doesn't manifest himself all over the earth. In the earth that God created, he was moving all places on the earth, but there was only one place he would manifest himself. And that one place he manifested himself was in the Garden of Eden. Now, I know that that sort of rubs you a little bit, but I'm going to have you thinking a little bit this morning. God's presence filled heaven. But he took a piece of heaven called the garden of God, took a piece of the garden of God and placed that piece of the garden of God on earth in a place called Eden so that Eden would now have the guard, a piece of the garden of God on Eden, meaning that God in the garden of God in heaven would manifest himself and he took a part of the garden of God, placed it on the earth, called it Eden so that he could manifest himself in Eden on the earth. Keep up with me now. And what, and I'm going to show you this, and while he was in Eden, that was the only place God would manifest himself to Adam. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 tells us this. And the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Wait a minute, what about the other places on the earth? God wasn't walking there to fellowship with Adam. He only walked in the Garden of Eden to fellowship with him. That's where God's presence, manifested presence was on the earth. Lord have mercy. It was so important. The Bible says God took the man and put him in the garden. God took the man, put him in the place where his manifested presence would be. He didn't put him outside of the garden. He put him right where his manifest presence would be. Now, when God put him right where his manifest presence was, that means that man did not have to go and look, search, and discover Eden. Eden was not an option for man. Eden was a requirement from God for man because God put him there for a reason and for a purpose. Man didn't have to go find Eden. God put him there. And when God put him there, he gave him two commands. I want you to dress it and keep it. Now, this is just that one verse alone is amazing because when we start talking about Eden, we need to understand some things about this place called Eden. Eden in Hebrew has several different words to describe it. Several different words and a couple of phrases to describe what it is. I mean, I have to do some, some, some digging on this. I want you to write these down. In Hebrew, Eden has the understanding of, the word Eden has the understanding of delight, perfect, pleasure, presence, or atmosphere. Eden also means to experience and to know. We're not finished yet. Eden 
Eden also means in the Hebrew mind, a door opening up to a pathway. And Eden means life and activity. Those are a whole lot of words to describe Eden. So let's see if we can put it together so it makes sense for us as to why Eden is so important. Eden is an atmosphere or an environment to experience where there is a door that opens the pathway of life into the presence of God. Lord, have mercy. Wait, wait, no, see, you got, you, see, you got to grab hold of this. God took a part of the garden of God where his presence manifested, put it down here on the earth in a place called Eden, in the garden of Eden, and that's the only place the manifestation of his presence would be. And so God wanted, he, he, he put the man in his presence in Eden. And he put him in his presence for a purpose and a reason. Now, Eden means, let me, let me read it again, because it took me a while to put all this together to make sense. Eden means it is an atmosphere or an environment to experience where there is a door that opens the pathway of life into the presence of God. It's a door that opens the pathway of life into the presence of God. Now God gave Adam, I mentioned these two commands because all this is going to make sense here in a second. He said, I want you to dress the garden and keep it. Now, now in, in Hebrew, in God's mind, in the Hebrew understanding, the word dress means to tend or to cultivate. And when we go to and, 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 and look up the definitions for, for the word dress, we see tend and cultivate. Many times I did this, we would stop. And we heard messages. I used to preach a message. Adam had to tend the garden, till the garden, keep the weeds out. But God's not talking about cultivating horticultural things like that. The word dress in Hebrew also means to serve. It also means a place or act of worship. Spiritual service. So God put Adam in the Garden of Eden in his presence, not to till or tend the soil, but to provide spiritual service, to worship and obey God, to dress it. As long as you're in my presence, just worship me. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Just worship me. As long as you're in Eden, you're in the atmosphere to worship God. And he also said, I want you to keep it. To keep means to guard or to take care of. So in Hebrew, that means this. Adam, I want you to keep the garden, meaning I want you to watch over the garden and keep it holy and sinless. Don't let the garden or my presence be contaminated with sin. That's your responsibility, Adam. To worship me and to keep sin out of my presence. Oh, Lord, have mercy, Jesus. Because Adam failed to dress and keep the garden. Because Adam failed to dress and keep the garden. Sin entered into the garden and Adam lost access to the presence of God. 
And whenever we lose access to God's presence, surely you shall die. You know it. If, if you have any kind of spiritual sensitivity, you'll know it immediately that I messed up. How many has ever messed up and you felt convicted right away? Right. And listen, not tomorrow, not last, listen, not a month, but right, right after you do it, you feel convicted. Why? Because it's pulled on God's presence. You've allowed sin to enter into the presence of God. And God says, you will surely die if you mess up like this. So Adam's sin calls the door to the pathway to God's presence to be closed and locked. And God guarded his presence. You read in Genesis chapter 3 with cherubim, flaming swords. So Adam could not get back, could not bring sin into the presence of God. That's just how holy God is. Eden was a place for man to have constant fellowship with God. The atmosphere in Eden was God's presence. Can you imagine? You already have maximum intelligence, full knowledge and wisdom. If you speak of something, it's going to happen because you made it just like God. And understand this. God never spoke what he didn't want to happen. And somebody will catch that later on. See, we, we, we many times spend too much time speaking stuff that we want to happen. Even if it's just colloquialism, if it sounds cute, or it's just because we heard we were raised that way. But God never spoke what he did not want to happen. God only spoke what he wanted to occur. And because he only spoke what he wanted, it manifested. So we are made in his image and his likeness. We need to change our vocabulary and change the way we talk and change the way we listen. Ain't nothing cute about trying to take sides with the devil. I need to line up and be who God wants me to be in. In his presence, I speak like God speaks. And that's what Adam was doing. Speaking the way God speaks. Glory to God. The atmosphere in Eden was God's presence. And here's what I want you to grab hold to. Eden then was God's dwelling place on earth. Eden was God's dwelling place on earth. Eden was God's tabernacle. God always wanted to dwell with man on earth. He always wanted a place where his spirit could manifest, his presence could manifest. Eden was God's tabernacle on earth, which means that it was movable. Wherever Adam moved in the garden, guess what was with Adam when he moved? The presence of God. And wherever God moved in the garden, his presence moved. Guess who moved with the presence? Adam. He was always in the presence of God. And his service in the presence of God was to serve and worship him. And to keep sin out of Eden. Lord have mercy, Jesus. Access to God's presence was lost because of sin. And Adam really knew immediately when he messed up. He didn't die a physical death immediately, but he knew that he was separated from God. Because Adam, the moment he sinned, the first thing that came out of Adam's mouth was, I'm naked. 
I'm naked. The, the presence is no longer with me. I'm, I, some, some, something missing. Some, something. I, 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 Lord, have, what, what? Oh, God, I know what it is. Oh, man, I messed up. I've messed up. Jesus was aware that God's spirit had departed from him on, on the cross of Calvary. No, Jesus bore our sin, became sin for us. And God's presence was with Jesus the entire time he was in the earth realm, except one, one time. And that one time was when Jesus was on the cross of Calvary. Jesus knew that was going to happen because in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup away from me. I don't want to be out of your presence. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus knew that God's presence had departed. Matthew chapter 27, one verse, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you withdrawn your presence from me? However, Samson, like many Christians living today, was not aware of God's presence departing. Judges chapter 16. For you see, we, 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 we modern day Christians, we become too accustomed to going in and out of the presence of God. In and out of God's presence. We do everything we want to do outside of his presence and then all of a sudden we, we get, we want to get right and run right back into his presence. Think that's going to, we, we think that's being a Christian. We run in and out. And you, when you kept running in and out, you know, it's, it's almost like putting, you saw this example. I just used this example. Many times there was an example how people used to, they had to do it, but it was an example how people would, would cook a frog alive. Put it on a stove in some water and just gradually turn the heat up. The heat gets up, gradually goes up, the frog doesn't even know it's getting hot. Pretty soon, the water's boiling, the frog gone now. Look out, saints. We keep running in and out of the presence of God. Every time we run out of God's presence, the heat goes up a little bit. And we don't even know it. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. We Listen, we think we're slick. We think we're good. And listen... We think we got it. Many times we say, oh, it ain't going to happen to me. I, I, I'm, I'm saved. I know how to protect myself. I know how far to go. Uh, you know, I, I, I know I'm good with God. I, I, know, I know the tricks of the devil. He tried this before. And I, I know what the devil's going to do. The moment you start talking and thinking like that, you're ready for a fall. Amen. Let me show you what's going on here. Judges chapter 16, verse 19. And she, talking about Delilah, made him sleep upon her knees. And when he was knocked out, she called for a man. And she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him. And his strength went from him. Samson, this giant of a man, all this strength was getting beat up by a woman. She began to afflict him. Now, now watch what's happening here. I want you to grab hold of this. This is how the enemy works. When we flirt with the devil, he does things that will put us to sleep. We get so comfortable in that position. And, and usually, it's a person he works through. Some, somebody you become friends with. Somebody that you like. Somebody you're trying to impress. Somebody you think is on your side. And they, and, and, and they do their thing, and all the time, they have an ulterior motive. And so, they put us to sleep. 
And the Bible says that while, while we are sleeping, they afflict us. And the word of God went on to say, and his strength was from him. Verse 20 says, and she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke up out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He was put to sleep by the devil. Because he'd been on in and out of the presence of God. In and out of the presence of God. Listen, you know better. You weren't raised that way. In and out of the presence of God. I don't know who I'm talking to. In and out of the presence of God. In and out of the presence of God. And you don't even know when God's spirit, his presence, when he's kicked you out of Eden. Don't even know it. And you try to do what you always have done and it doesn't work. And you wonder, God, where are you? I rebuke the devil. Too late to rebuke the devil now. You've already drunk the Kool-Aid. Oh, Jesus. So I'm going to leave with this question. How important is God's presence to you? Exodus chapter 33 Let's look at some things here. Very interesting. In Exodus chapter 33, we see Moses talking to God about his presence. In verses 2 and 3, God tells Moses, Moses, the children of Israel are a stiff-necked, disobedient bunch of folk. I've tried to show them how much I love them, how much I care for them, but they still keep refusing me. And rejecting me. So you want to go into the promised land? You can go. But I'm not going with you. My presence will not go with you. I will send an angel. To go with you. To fight on your behalf. But my presence will not go. So we take it up over here. At verse 12. And Moses. Moses this, this thing bothers Moses. Because Moses has learned the importance of being and staying in the presence of God. See, you can't do what you want to do in life except by the presence of God. I, I, I cannot do what, what I'm doing today without having spent time in God's presence. I know that I've been in the presence of God. Because in, when you're in his presence, one of the first things that happens is that you do a self-evaluation. Look at your hands. Look at your feet. Check your heart, check your head. Because I'm in the presence of a holy God. I, I can't bring mess in God's presence. I can't bring unforgiveness in God's presence. I can't bring bitterness in God's presence. I can't bring anger in God's presence. I, I can't do that because I don't want to get kicked out of his presence. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, bring up this people. And thou hast not let me know who thou wilt send with me. If you're not going, who are you going to send? I want somebody who's just like you. I don't want, I just don't want anybody. You haven't told me who you're going to send with me. I mean, M M Moses recognizes how important God's presence is. And thou hast not let me know who thou wilt send. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name. And thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now watch this now. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me thy way. That's so important. When you operate in God's grace, you will know the ways of God. And when you know the ways of God, you will be operating in God's grace. That's what Moses is saying. I know that if, if, I, if I found grace in your eyes, show me your ways. Your grace will reveal your ways to me. Your grace on my life reveals your ways to me. I'm going to say that again. Your grace upon my life reveals your ways to me. And I will follow your ways by your grace. I want to know your way that I may know thee. That I may find grace in thy sight. 
And please consider that this nation are your people. And God said, my presence shall go with thee. When you're in the presence of God, look at the next thing that happens. I will give you rest. Don't fret. Don't worry. Don't doubt. Don't lose sleep. Don't fuss. Don't become overwhelmed by it. Don't become preoccupied with thinking about it. In the presence of God, there's rest and peace. That's what God says. I'll give, my, I'll give you my presence. I'll give you rest. And he said, Moses said, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up thence. I ain't going. If I know your presence is not with me, they can say what they want to say. I ain't going. I'm staying right here until you lead me where you want me to go. Until I can feel your presence. Until I get back to Eden where I can worship you and I can serve you and I can protect your presence, God. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that in that thou goest with us, so shall we be separated, and I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? God's presence makes us different. Doesn't make you better. Just makes you different. What do you mean makes you different? Well, I don't worry like the world worries. What I see on TV doesn't move me. I know who's in charge of this now. I know the end of the story. If I don't see it with my eyes, I'll see it when I come back with Jesus. I know how the story ends. So I don't worry about this stuff. Why do we worry about things you can't control? That's what the world wants to do. Stay in Eden and have the peace of God, the presence of God all around you. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the concept of being in God's presence is not an event, but it's a way of life. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of being in the presence of God. It's a lifestyle of worshiping God. There's so much we can do in life, so much more, by being in the presence of God. Let me give you an idea of what the Bible says, what God says. You, when I read this, you remember what I'm talking about. Staying in Eden and in the presence of God God told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. The only way you can be fruitful and multiply is with my atmosphere. Replenish the earth. The only way you can replenish the earth is to stay in my atmosphere. Subdue the earth. The only way you can subdue the earth is to be in my environment. And have dominion over the earth. The only way you and I can walk in dominion is to spend time in the presence of God. We, in his presence, we can do all this and we can do even more. When we stay in the atmosphere of worship, we stay in the atmosphere of worship in the presence of God. Until the whole earth is filled with his glory. That was what he wanted Adam to do. Just stay in my presence until the whole earth is filled with my glory. How is that going to happen? Be fruitful and multiply. Teach your children to stay in the presence of God. Teach your children to stay in Eden. Everything centers around the presence of God. For Jesus said in John 15 and 5, 
For without me, my presence, my spirit, you can do nothing. My time is up. Can we give the Lord a clap off in this morning? Bless the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. God is so good. God created man to live in Eden. To stay in his presence. How many times have we had a choice to either be in the presence of God or not be in his presence? And how many times have we decided to not be in the presence of the Lord? Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Most gracious and faithful God, our Father, our Redeemer, the glory and the lifter of our heads, our sustainer, the giver of life and peace and rest, the God of mercy, the God of grace, the all-sufficient God, the God who's more than enough. You become all of this to us and more as we spend time in your presence. Teach us how to rest Grace us so that we can know your ways. God, be glorified in our lives. In every aspect, teach us to have peace and contentment in your presence. Grant us the lifestyle of being in your presence. And teach us how to guard, be watchful, so that no sin can enter into your presence through us that, con that would contaminate your environment. Gracious Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We honor you. Let's all lift our hands before the Lord just as a show of worship to surrender our hearts to Jesus just take this moment to surrender to the Lord thank you Jesus yes just surrender it all to Jesus surrender everything to him some of us on the cusp of making major decisions and we are tempted to make those decisions without God's presence as Moses said if you don't be with us we're not going anywhere if I don't know your presence is with me if I don't know that I'm in your presence, I'm not moving. I'm staying right where I am. Gracious Father, we bless you today. God of glory, we just bow before you. We give, surrender all of our hearts, our desires, our intentions, our emotions, our bodies. Let your presence, the manifestation of your presence, overwhelm the sanctuary, overwhelm those who are viewing. Just fill us with your presence. Like Adam and Eve experienced in Eden before they sinned. Thank you, Jesus. 
That could be someone viewing from home and says, Pastor, I, I would love to seriously be able to do this, but I can't. I, I just, I'm nowhere close to that. You can experience the presence of God. The only way you can do that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father except through Jesus. So if you'd like to have access to the presence, the manifested presence of God himself in your life so God can tabernacle in you, you need Jesus. So pray this prayer with me. Say, oh God, I'm living without Jesus. I desire to be in your presence. And I know according to your word and the message, the only way that can happen is through Jesus. So I believe that Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for my sins. I believe he spent three days and three nights in the belly of the earth so that when I die, I won't die in sin and go to hell. And I believe, Father, you raised him from the dead on the third day with all glory and power in his hand. So I thank you, Father, that I can now confess with my mouth that I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. It's just that simple. And we are so excited that you made the decision to accept Jesus Christ in your heart and surrender everything to him. If you're in the triad area and you're without a church home, we're asking that you would please contact us write to us, call us, send us an email so that we can partner with you to see how God is going to move in your life and that you can be able to begin to walk and live in the presence of God. If you're not in the triad area, we ask, we're praying that God would direct you to a Bible teaching, Bible believing church right where you are so that you can grow into things of God. We thank you so much for tuning into our broadcast. What an honor it is to share God's word with you. We pray you've been blessed today and your heart has been challenged that you would get more into the word of God and be more sensitive to being in his presence. Tune in next week for another exciting broadcast. We are so excited what God will be saying and God will be doing next week as we talk more from the word of God from why God created man. Have a happy and safe Thanksgiving and know this for sure that God loves you just like you are, just where you are, and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless you. Have an awesome day. In Jesus name. Thank you for watching Praise Assembly Church Ministries with Dr. Johnny L. York. If you were blessed by today's message and would like a CD or DVD, email us at info at pacmchurch.org. Praise Assembly is a ministry where everyone is welcome. Come join us for our Sunday worship services at 3254 Kernsville Road, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. For more information, visit our website at pacmchurch.org. See you next week at the same place and time. And remember, it's all about Jesus. Praise Assembly Church Ministries is more than a church. It's more than a place to go on Sundays. Yes, the word is great, the music is outstanding, and the people are nice. But it's more than that. Praise Assembly is a place where everyone is welcome. A place where everyone fits in and prayer is at the foundation of everything we do. A life-changing church where you can become who God created you to be. Where Jesus is the minister of the sanctuary and people will love you just the way you are. At Praise Assembly, the doors are open and we are ready to receive you.